Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. And we'll begin our reading at verse 9. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 9. And let's we'll stand for the reading of God's Word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 19. We'll be coming back to Thessalonians next time. There are several passages that deal with the concept of natural revelation. There are a multitude of passages that deal with the idea of divine revelation as far as Scripture is concerned. God has chosen to reveal himself in three different ways. And we're going to be looking at at least two of those, and probably the third one a little bit toward the end of the message here today. Psalm 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament of the skies showeth his, his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. That first half of the psalm deals with the concept of natural revelation. It's also expanded on a great deal in Romans chapter 1. Humanity is without excuse, so says the book of Romans. We are without excuse because creation demands that there is a creator. Now, I know that there are people who profess to be atheists. There are people that say that there is no God required to explain what is. And yet, uh, it's a fascinating thing that the, uh, it's not even a theory, the, uh, the hypothesis of evolution is not something that if it was come up with today instead of 150 years ago, and it actually predates Darwin a little bit as well, but if it were come up with today, it would be laughed off the scene because of things that we know today. The idea that you can create life out of nothing, that you can have complexity and that it slowly builds up, that we start with a, a lightning strike in the primordial soup that somehow created a, a single-celled organism, and that uh, from that various mutations came until we went from this, uh, this microscopic uh, little blob to, uh, to human beings and giraffes and elephants and whales is, is frankly nonsense. Uh, it is not possible. It doesn't work according to the laws of physics, and frankly, if they're going to be honest, it doesn't work in biology either. If you were to take, we have two different things. I'm going to deal with two different scientific aspects, and then we'll look at the, the Scripture some more. But I want you to understand there are two basic premises that would totally annihilate the whole idea of, of, uh, of evolution. One is the idea of, uh, of irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. Uh, this is a, if you, uh, if you remember high school biology, or maybe this is something you've looked at uh, more recently, but the, the cell that makes up our bodies, and we, we are made up of millions and millions of these things, all very different from one another, and yet all of them containing the same DNA, each unique to each individual, that that cell is a vastly more complicated thing than any of the automobiles that are parked out here. Your cell is an extremely 
complicated piece of machinery. It is made up of building blocks. Each building block is a protein that has to be exactly so, and it has to be folded up a particular way in order to make that building block. The DNA in there determines what you are. It is the, the computer program that tells you what you are. And a cell, by the way, what makes proteins? A cell makes proteins. But a cell is made of proteins. So what came first, the, the protein or the cell? You have to have them both at the same time. Proteins do not exist in, a, in any kind of tangible form in nature outside of biology. God created cells. God created animals. God created people. He did not create the, the initial matter and energy and then let it run on its own. God made the complicated world that we, and very organized world that we, we live in today. And as damaged and tainted and as corrupted as it is by sin, it is still a remarkable work of God's comprehensive design that everything works exactly as it's supposed to work. Now, irreducible. And over a period of time, taking off this piece and that piece, somebody who knows what they're doing, will reach a point where, you know, if we take off one more thing, this car won't work. We've been very careful about what we removed, and it looks awful now, but you know what? It'll still function. But if we remove one more piece, it won't function. If we get to that point, we are still dealing with an incredibly complex piece of equipment. Because we have all kinds of extras in our cars. Some of you, some of you, still know how to drive a manual. All right? Uh, <laughs> uh, some of us remember what it was like before power brakes and all the different extras that we have on our cars. I want you to know that by and large, the cells that make up your body have no extras. They are designed to do a single task. They do it well, but there's no frills on the cells of your body. They are already, for the most part, at irreducible complexity. You have to start out with this outrageously complex, little teeny tiny microscopic machine. You have to start out with something that is that complex. That would be like having an explosion in a scrapyard and all of a sudden, wham, there's a 747. It's that kind of complication. And yet they expect us to believe that somehow or another, spontaneously, by random chance, a cell that was fully capable of reproducing itself, because if it doesn't reproduce itself, that's the end of it anyway. This random, this random mutation, this random act created a cell, and they would say it happens all the time. It happens over and over and over again. That somehow this thing created all that was. Folks, to believe that there is a God who created this is a far more reasonable and statistically possible option because what they're asking us to believe is impossible. Statistically, it is impossible. You cannot create something that is that complicated randomly. It's not possible. Irreducible complexity. The other one is that your DNA is a computer language. It is a computer. We hear about uh, they, they're mapping DNA. And that the DNA, that, that, which is an outrageously long single molecule, is basically, it's not binary, but it's, it's four different uh, pieces that, that, are inter that go back and forth on this. I'm uh, thank you, I'm getting some confirmation over here with my medical people. And it is a code for determining your eye color, how tall you are for the most part, whether or not you have hair when you get older, the number of teeth you have in your head, everything about you, what makes you different from a pig or, or, or a groundhog or a mouse or a microbe. It's the design, it is a computer program that determines what you are, what you look like, what functions. It is a readable program. The program, however, determines the cell and it can't exist outside of a cell. It is also not random. And it also has a bunch of different components that all have to fit together. 
Have you considered the human eye, how complicated it is? And yet all these different pieces are different parts on that DNA strand. And yet it's supposed to be random. It's supposed to be chance that we have a lens, that we have these little filaments that stretch it out to allow you to see far or relax it to see up close. That we have eyelids that, that uh, lubricate the thing. That we have eyelashes to keep the dust and eyebrows to keep the dust out of our eyes. That we have different fluids before and after the lens to, uh, to create just the right thing. And then this, out, this, this amazing lining on the inside of the eyeball that, that, uh, that receives the light in such a way to create pictures in our brain. And of course, this is all random chance. And we can go through the ear and, the, and all the other senses that we have. We can go through the digestive system, the circulatory system, all these different things that are all just as complicated and all have to interact and all are required to sustain each other. And it's all by chance. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Creation demands a creator. God made matter and energy, and then with that, made everything else. Everything you see demands a creator. And the only reason they hang on to evolution is because they have built such a huge edifice on top of a lie that they can't let go of it. Understand that there are basically only four options as far as how explaining what is, is. How it got here. One is that there is a creator that made it. Number two, that it's random chance, and that's what the, the world by and large holds to. The other one is, it isn't really here. And the other one, it's always been exactly as it is. Okay, the last two, no one really holds to. People who would insist on that don't operate as if it really is true. And evolution is not possible statistically either. We are left with a creation that demands a creator. And the scripture says that. The heavens declare the glory of God. And why, why do you suppose that virtually every culture around the world has a creation story, which, by the way, is a corruption of the truth? It's a corruption of the truth. This is something, well, we've got to figure out where this came from. No, they, the, humanity started out with the truth and then abandoned it. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. We'll come back to, to Psalm uh, 19 in a moment. But let's go to Romans chapter 1, which is the other pa main passage that deals with this idea of natural revelation. And let me get my eyes again. And he goes through this to explain the guilt of mankind because we started out with the truth. Starting at verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible, look at this, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is a God out there. How can you, how, how, prove to me there's a God. The very fact that you are asking this question, that you are there, that you exist, is a testimony to the fact there's a God. And just going through the, the, the things that we've looked at in the scriptures and, and irreducible complexity, the, the idea that the DNA and so on is a language, and there's a whole host of other things we could look at. But these are unanswerable questions. Things that they don't want to go to. They have people who are supposed to be at the top of the academic food chain, who are the brilliant scholars who are supposed to have answers to this, are finally resorting to saying, well, aliens brought it here from another planet. <laughs> and all that does is remove it one step.
to a place where we can't analyze it. And so we just have to take it by faith that it came here from, by aliens. I mean, Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk brought it here. It is a desperate move to remove God from the equation. Because if indeed there is a creator, if there is indeed a God who made me, then ultimately I am accountable to that God. And as it is appointed unto men once to die after this, the judgment, I am accountable to this God. That after I leave this world, I am accountable for what I did with the knowledge I had. Did I accept what God had revealed or did I not? It says we are without excuse. I am accountable for what God has revealed. And the amazing thing is, as people reject God, I'm not going to go into the, the whole details there, but in Romans chapter 1, it snowballs. As people reject God, they, they, they worship and serve the, the creation rather than the creator. They pursue the, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They become wrapped up in the tangibles and totally ignore the, the God that is in heaven. They create gods in their own image and worship and serve themselves. And they attain, they establish our, we, we establish our own righteousness. There is no, according to the, the governments that be, there are no absolutes. Government decrees what is right and what is wrong. Society, culture determines what's right and wrong, which is always in a state of flux. It's only a matter of time before pedophilia becomes legal. I read this past week that there was a fellow who got his doctorate and it was approved, he's Dr. So-and-so, defending a thesis that defends pedophilia in a United States university. Well, it's all by the individual. It's, there are no absolutes. There are no rights and wrongs. It's what, what culture and society and the government determines what's right and wrong. Well, which, gov which government? Which society, which culture? You go around different places in the world, different places in history. And the, 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 the great horrific atrocities, genocides, and everything else that have been accomplished in, in world history have always been justified by governments and culture. God has decreed what's right and wrong. There is a God who created us. And we ultimately are accountable to him. It is appointed unto men once to die, after this, the judgment. There's a God who made us, and there's a God who will hold us to account. We are without excuse. Creation demands a creator. Now, with that piece of information, with that that we've just looked at, we have an amazing God whose power, whose, whose brilliance is beyond the scope of our comprehension, that you have a God who in a moment of time spoke all that is into existence. All this intricate design that makes up you. God, like that, did it. And that we are without excuse. This creates a dilemma. This creates a, a great difficulty for us because with that, creation is enough to damn me, but creation is not enough to save me. There's a God who made me that I am accountable to. There's no redemption in that information. There's no forgiveness in that information. There is simply enough to condemn me. Let's look at the next step there in Psalm 19. We go from natural revelation to written revelation. How can I know specifically about this creator? How can I know the, the name? I see that he's powerful. I know I'm ultimately accountable to him because I am part of his creation. 
But how can I know what he wants? How can I know of salvation? Is there a hope of, of having, of knowing this God, knowing this creator? And so we deal with written revelation starting in verse 7. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it say? Converting the soul. I can know of salvation by the scripture. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And of course, the whole idea of, of wisdom in your Old Testament wisdom literature is dealing with the knowledge of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I'm going to cite a passage we looked at, and you've heard it many times here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's profitable for doctrine. Here's what you need to believe. For reproof, we are out of line. We are sinners. We are wicked. We, we need to be called to account. Hey, buddy, you're out of line. That's what the Scripture says. For correction, all right, here's how we fix what's broken. And then instruction on in righteousness. Now that you've been condemned and then fixed, here's how you're to live. The Scripture tells us all those things. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the, the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Do you have a hunger, a passion for the Word of God? Or do you take the attitude of, well, I haven't read my Bible in a while, I need to do that. Or, I'm reading, I've got my... I've got my, my Bible reading guide, and uh, I, I need to drag my eyes across the page and cover this so that by the end of the year I can say, I read my Bible. I've read it through. Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? Why do you read your Bible? Is it because of a, of a sense of expectation? Is it uh, of, of necessity? Or is it because I need to find out what God has for me. I need to let God speak to me. I need to learn more of what God would have for me. I need, if I am going to grow in Christ, if I am to grow in my relationship with God, then I need to, to immerse myself in the Word of God. And you've heard it over and over again. I also need to think biblically. This world is pulling me off in all these different directions. The great lie that there is no creator, I'm being, the world embraces that. I'm being pulled by all these lies all over the place. Folks, we are inundated today with lies. All the time. Reputable sources are lying to you. And they'll say, yes, they said this. Let's, let's, let's separate the science and the politics and all that other stuff and let's chuck it all, all. And folks, as Christians, as God's children, let's think biblically. Let's think biblically. Because I'm telling you, we are distracted, distracted, distracted. We are distracted by the folks on the right, and we are distracted by the folks on the left. And we are consumed by these things. And what do we ignore? What God says. Because somehow, somehow, to some degree at least, we confuse what it says here with what's said by the folks here. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm reading a book right now. <laughs> it is amazing. Do you know that we've been through this before? Because there's nothing new under the sun. The, the, we, we've been through this before. Uh, a great deal of what is, what is recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs 
is not, that, now granted it deals with stuff that took place during the Roman persecutions and so on, but a lot of it had, has to deal with stuff that went on during all the upheaval and everything in the 17th century in England. Same reason all the pilgrims and stuff came over, and the Puritans came over here. To escape persecution. Bad theology creates bad behavior. We are going to create heaven on earth. We are going to create God's kingdom on earth in Massachusetts. I'm sorry, that isn't how, that isn't the kingdom as far as the Bible is concerned. And yet, a lot of these people were well-intentioned, Bible-believing people, born-again Christians. The Puritans finally took over. They went to war over this. Went to war in England. They cut off the head of the king. We had Oliver Cromwell for a number of years. And then, of course, revival wears off, and they brought, brought the, the king's, uh, the king's uh, relative over to, a to become Charles II, and the whole thing started over again. Why? Because they're confused. Because we're fixated on the, on, the, uh, on the right, and we're fixated on the left, and we won't look at what God says. Don't confuse the scripture with what's going on here. Please. It is our worst enemy, and we don't even realize it. We are a confused people. Christians are wrapped up in things that are of no eternal consequence. God has given us his word. And he says in verse 10, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. We spend our lives chasing tangibles. We, cha we spend our lives chasing experiences. The Word of God is more satisfying than wealth. It is more satisfying than any experience you can have. Because tied to this is your relationship with your Creator, which will never end. The Scripture says we brought nothing into this world as certain we can carry nothing out. Then why are we so fixated on things that we can't keep? Our focus needs to be on our relationship with our God. We can have and need to have a wonderful relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ because these are eternal relationships as well. And we need to be fixated, fixated on sharing the gospel with other people that we might have more brothers and sisters because as we saw in the Sunday school hour, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and those without Christ will bow the knee and acknowledge him as, a, as Lord as they are cast into the lake of fire. Because damnation is just as real as heaven. And you and I have a gospel message, good news, to tell this world that sees that there's a creator by the, and, they are, and they're without excuse. And there's enough evidence in creation to damn them, but we are the ones that have God's word and we are the ones that have the gospel message to be able to give this to people so that they can be saved. Now I know that most people that hear the message will not believe it. They will not accept it. But many of you, we have, we have quite a few folks in our congregation that got saved as adults. And you look back at your pre-salvation days. And look back, I'm one, at your scoffing before, your mocking of the gospel. Because there was a time in my life, if I look at, at, at me at that particular age, I was like, that's the last person on earth that's going to get saved. And now he's pastoring a Baptist church. That's the grace of God. Amen. You never know. You never know. <laughs> I will tell you, sometimes, matter of fact, more than some, very often, the person that gets saved is, the, if you were to pick the, the, the person out of the room that you think is the least likely to get saved, that's the one who's going to get saved. It is a, a trophy of the grace of God that God saves any but that he saves very often the least likely. And so I have 
this delightful, delectable Word of God. And so I am to strive to serve my God now that I, I know Him. Look at verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Talking about our own. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Lord, open my eyes to the, to the sin that's in my life that I may probably not even aware of. It's easy to see it in everybody else. Oh, I can't believe so. Did you see what he said? Do you see what he did? Oh, look at that person. Oh, ah, ah, look in the mirror. As I mentioned last week, we, most of the time we are our own worst enemy. Verse 13, keep back also thy servant from presumptuous sins. What's a presumptuous sin? A believer who is walking with God, present tense, is presently walking with God, will not commit presumptuous sins. A believer who is walking with God has, gets, gets hit broadside and surprised by temptation and slips and falls. Presumptuous sin is something I've planned out. Presumptuous sin is something that I'm, I'm scheming and preparing for. Oh, I'm going to go and do this. Yes, I'm going to do this. Yes, I'm planning on doing this. I have my plans, my aspirations. I am doing this. I know I'm going to do this. I, with a forethought, premeditated sin. That's what it's talking about. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. The sin that you can't seem to let go of, the sin that has been an ongoing struggle with you, perhaps for years or even decades, granted, it is a serious temptation. Yes, there are, are, are struggles with this. But the reason you don't have victory over it, let's be honest, is because you love your sin more than you love the Lord. You are unwilling to take the steps necessary to get rid of it. Well, I, 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 if you struggle with pornography, you are better off without a computer or a cell phone than struggling with pornography, period. Get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. Because you are valuing your electronics more than you value your relationship with God. And if whatever the case may be, whatever you're struggling with, it may cost you to gain victory. Is the victory worth it to you? Because if not, you are valuing your sin more than you value your relationship with God. Is it worth the cost? And I will tell you, it is. It is. Because otherwise, I am guilty of presumptuous sin. I, I know that temptation is right there. And instead of fleeing it, instead of running away from it, instead of doing everything I can to keep from, from doing that, I allow all the mechanisms to be there so that when the opportune moment hits, I can go and indulge my sin. If I'm an alcoholic, I'm not going to be keeping liquor in my house. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then how are we to live? We are ambassadors for Christ. He says in verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart People hear what I say. God sees what's going on on the inside. And both of them matter to God. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, both be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my, what's that last word? Redeemer. My salvation comes from Jesus Christ. And I live a life for God, in gratitude, in thanksgiving, folks, in thanksgiving for the redemption that comes through Christ. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look at the last thing. 
God has revealed himself in three ways. God has revealed himself in creation. That creation, creation demands a creator. God made the stuff he made the matter, he made the energy, and he organized it and made all this, this outrageously complicated world and universe that we live in. He made it all. And he's, in the Genesis account, talks about the sun and the moon, and it says, he made, just in passing, he made the stars also. All the stuff that you see with a telescope in the summertime, you don't see it in the winter here. All, all that stuff that is, that is huge beyond comprehension and distant, God spoke and bang, there it was. God caused it to be. All that we see and walk on and can hold in our hands and everything, God took his time with. Six days. But he made the sun, the moon, and the stars in one. It wasn't that it was too much for God and he took six days. Because he did all the rest of it in one. We are dealing with a, a, a God who is worthy of our worship. And yet this great God who made I talked about the, the germs on the palm of your hand last week. We are the, the germs that God loves. He reveals himself through creation. God, to give us the details, to tell us of salvation, gave us scripture that this is a remarkable book. It is without error. It is God-breathed. It was written over a period of a little over 1,500 years by over 40 human authors, inspired by the Holy Scripture, by the Holy Spirit of God, and all these diverse people over various centuries, writing by inspiration, all the pieces fit together. It is a remarkable thing. It is a remarkable thing. God has given us his perfect word to tell us about himself. And so we have natural revelation, the stuff that we see all around us. We have God's written revelation that we have right there on your lap. Is there another revelation? Yes, there is. And I don't mean the dreams that you have at night. A vision that you had while you were eating breakfast. No, something far greater. In Hebrews chapter 1, start in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, giving us what was at this time our Old Testament. Most of the New Testament, a good portion of the New Testament had not yet been written when Hebrews was written hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The third form of revelation is the incarnate Son, whom God hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, God sustains his creation, when he had by himself purged our sins, the sacrifice on Calvary, the satisfaction of God's justice, sat down, the job being completed. You know, the, the, the priests in a Levitical system, the tabernacle, the temple, there's no chairs, there's no benches. The work was never finished. Century after century, millions and millions of sacrificial animals, the job never done. The book of Hebrews says the, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. They were simply a picture of the one sacrifice that would and did. When he had himself by himself purged our sins, 
sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, tying with what, in with what we saw in the Sunday school hour, dealing with Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. So God has revealed himself to us in three ways. Creation, the scripture, and the son. The son is the fulfillment of the scripture. He is the creator. They all tie together. Because without the incarnate son, the scripture can't be fulfilled. Without the incarnate son, the promises of redemption and forgiveness and a relationship with our creator are not possible. The incarnate son provides for forgiveness. He purges our sins. He redeems us. He buys us to himself that we might have forgiveness and a relationship with our creator God. Now, we have looked at all of this. Thursday is Thanksgiving. Do we, as God's children, those of us who recognize God in creation, those who have seen God in the scripture and have a relationship with our Savior through Jesus Christ. Do we have cause for thanksgiving? Do we have, let's turn it around, do we have cause for giving of thanks? We do. Absolutely. And may I urge you not to set it aside for a turkey dinner on a Thursday in November. That every day and every hour we need to have an attitude of gratitude. A thanksgiving to our creator, our redeemer, our savior. And a giving of thanks for a God who has given all these things to us. Is it too much for us to live a life, as we saw back in our psalm, if I can flip back over there real quick, in that last verse, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of an eternity of thanks. And so, Father, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for the Savior. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for all these things. And, Father, as we have our dinner this afternoon, as we have our dinners on, on Thursday, may we think of you not only giving thanks for your provision for that meal, but most of all, for your provision that we might have everlasting life, that we might be your children, and that we might enjoy you forever. Father, thank you for the unspeakable gift that is Jesus Christ and the salvation we have through him. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand, please.